Uh, welcome. Thank you all for being here. This is like the best dressed room I've been in in a very long time. Uh, it's rather intimidating. Glad to have you all here. Glad to have you guys here. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, investing uh, at the earliest stages. So these three folks are pros when it comes to picking the company uh, before you've ever even heard of it. Uh, or if you've maybe heard of it, you don't really know what it does. And so what I wanted to do was first kind of set the stage for what kind of you know, the landscape is right now. Christine, you are out raising a fund. Topher, you recently said, we're not gonna raise any more funds. We think there's too much money <laughs> out there. Um, I would love to know, w w what am I missing here? Like, which, which one of you has, has it right? I don't know. Do you want to search? Uh, I don't know. It doesn't <laughs> so he here's my perspective on that. It's true. There are a ton of funds right now. There are more than 200 funds in Silicon Valley. Like, that's a lot of people out there investing. Um, and then you have people like Sequoia, who raised $9 billion in 18 months, and over nine funds. So you see this influx of capital into the market. Fundamentally for me, I decided to start my fund, and I was at a larger fund and broke off and started my own fund, because I invest in um, early stage at the intersection of life science and technology. So much like this conference is the intersection of sports and technology, in healthcare and life science and technology, that's the future of medicine. And we are at an unprecedented time of innovation. We are really at the beginning of a complete renaissance in healthcare. Um, and by the way, it also bleeds into sports in certain areas. So I'll talk about that a little bit. So, for me, there was really no question as to whether or not to do a fund. And I think in healthcare in particular, deep domain expertise makes all the difference in the world. So those specialty funds are the funds that will deliver outsized returns versus general funds. So in my particular sector, I think the new funds that are emerging, if they're specialized, there are great opportunities. Couldn't agree more on the specialized front. Like that's absolutely, and we're a more generalized fund. Um, healthcare and life sciences being just one of probably you know, 10, 15 sectors that we actually invest in. And I think, you know, like you said, the, no one can deny that the ecosystem is changing rapidly. Yeah. The, uh, the size of seed rounds now double, triple what they used to be. The valuations double, triple what they used to be. Um, the number of seed funds. Um, and then also the number of companies being started. Uh, and the pace that companies are being funded at is faster than we've ever seen before. And so in our particular case, you know, all of our LPs were all friends and family. We saw all these changes in the ecosystem and said, hey, you know, we don't feel comfortable investing friends and families' capital in this environment. Let's invest our own capital through this cycle. We'll see what it looks like on the other end. And then we also looked at, um, you know, just the general seed landscape and you know, there's no shortage of, you know, 200K checks, and that's, you know, where, what we were investing as a fund when we raised from outside LPs. What we saw was there's actually a shortage of smaller checks. There's a shortage of 50K checks, 25K checks, you know, from a, a professional seed fund that can hopefully add value to the company. So that's why we decided to go in that direction is, and we actually think we can fit in better into the ecosystem there and partner with other seed funds that have more domain experience um, you know, more, more verticalized domain experience. I spend a lot of my time writing about Facebook. Um, the talk right now is that Facebook's too dominant, Facebook's too powerful, it sucks all the oxygen out of the room. Same could be said about Google, Apple, Amazon. When you go out and you invest and you see those four or five massive tech companies already kind of doing a little bit of everything, what motivates you to think that this, you know, $25,000, $50,000 check is actually going to make a difference or something breakthrough? I think, you know, in no time before has the opportunity never been larger. Um, you know, when everyone says Facebook, uh, Google, Apple, you know, they're so big and so dominant, that's just when there's a perfect time for a startup to come off and start with one tiny behavior, you know, one tiny use case that might be part of the Facebook ecosystem, whether it be somewhere on WhatsApp or Instagram or, you know, within the core Facebook app. Um, but now with the world connected and mostly on smartphones, like I said, your, your potential market size is uncapped. And so 50K in, let's just use Facebook as the example, in the next Facebook, hey, a very small percentage of a massive number is still a huge number. It's, uh, 
Yeah, and the way we think about that is it's actually part of our investment thesis is you are seeing proof points of technology infiltrating healthcare, and the fact that you have tech giants entering the sector is a great thing. Like, that will lead to earlier acquisitions. Um, it, it's a little bit like, I don't know how familiar people are with Roche Genentech, but Roche was this, is this massive pharmaceutical company, and they had a partnership with Genentech because they knew innovation came from without. And so that really fueled their pipeline for years and years and years. So they ultimately bought them, but you'll see the same thing happen with the Googles and the Amazons of the world who are getting into healthcare in a very significant way. So for us, it just further validates the investment thesis. You're gonna see amazing companies that are growing over the next several years, many who will either partner with one of those tech companies or be acquired by one of those companies. Daniel, I'm wondering, because you do Series A around Seed there. Seed Series A, yeah. Seed and Series A. How has that dynamic changed the types of companies that you see come through your, your uh, come onto your radar? Yeah, so uh, the way that we think about the big four are, it's really hard for a startup to beat Facebook's A-team or Amazon's A-team. Um, and so if we're looking at a business that is a uh, kind of core priority for one of these companies, um, I think it's, it's it, the degree of difficulty in kind of getting there is just that much higher. I think where things can get really interesting is when you're competing with Amazon's kind of B team or C team, um, you know, where something's maybe a fifth, you know, number five on the priority list or number 10 on the priority list. That's where things get really interesting because those can often be really big, you know, markets. Um, but it's just not something that those big companies are, are putting their best people on. Is there, so, fear, is there fear, though, that, you know, it's the fifth priority for Facebook, but as soon as they see your startup doing well, that they're going to bump that up to second priority and, and crush you, right? I mean, there's, yeah. there's two options. There's one which is, hey, what a great opportunity. Now my, I have way more exits for all these investments I made. The other option is Facebook decides we want to crush you. And yeah. how yeah. do you deal with that? Yeah, and I think, um, you know, we are looking... Uh, we're, we're placing a lot more value on businesses with real moats, right? And those moats can be uh, in different forms. They can be some sort of two-sided network effect where, you know, you've got, you know, marketplace situation, you know, really engaged buyers and really engaged sellers. And, um, you know, at a certain scale, those businesses become really hard to kind of um, compete with. Um, not to say that it can't be done, but it just gets harder. There are other businesses, particularly in the healthcare space, like we're an investor in a company called K Health, which um, has uh, collected a whole bunch of really interesting data on, you know, patient health, right? Which is data that Facebook and some of the others don't don't have. And so I think the onus is on us as investors to really focus on moats and really try to understand what what is it about this, you know, Series A seed company that. Um, will allow it to kind of endure over time in the face of competition, not only from kind of at Facebook, but from sort of other large companies that, that may see that as an opportunity. Um, I want to talk sports a little bit. I found it interesting. None of the three of you are really heavily invested into any type of sports tech or sports uh, specific investments. I'm curious why. Is it because it, does the sports tech or sports business world not really lend too much at the stage that you're investing in? What, what do you think about the idea of kind of sports tech right now? So from my perspective, my background's healthcare. Um, that's where I grew up and that's my expertise. I will say I do think the technology that is impacting patient care also impacts sports in certain instances. And I'll give you a great example. It's a company I absolutely love. Um, it's a digital biomarker company and they basically use speech to early identify, uh, early diagnose disease. So one example would be, you can predict when a migraine will come on 12 hours before. That's incredibly valuable because you'll be able, you can treat migraine, right? For Parkinson's disease, you have to try titrate medicine all the time. It's a really complicated disease, but they can measure this all through speech. So think about that. Like you, you just have your own iPhone by your side and you're talking and it's capturing your voice and it's basically diagnosing you. It has applications in sports, and they're working with the Pac-12 right now on concussions and return to play. Um, they're also working on CTE. And so there's really unbelievably like powerful applications in sports as it relates to directly impacting contact sports. 
Um, they're having a lot of traction with the NHL. They think the, their first market entry will be youth sports, college sports. Um, but that's an interesting technology that will have applications both in healthcare and in sports. We're super bullish on this company, so that's a deal I would do in a heartbeat. They're early, they're seed. Um, but my area is not sports, but I do think that's just one example. There's other examples of neurostimulation technology that's being used to treat anxiety instead of taking a pill that will have applications on the sports side as well in a bunch of different areas in terms of concentration, relaxation, preparation for games. So I think you'll see a lot overlap there, but in very specific technology. Do you find that stuff comes across uh, that is intended for sports or that it's intended for other things and then someone says, hey, this could actually also work for, you know, my, my men's league team or whatever. So, so when, what, what I'm seeing, it's more starting with disease and then realizing applications in sports. But look, traumatic brain injury is a disease, right? Look at the end of the day. Um, I do believe, though, that there will be areas where it will happen the opposite way. You'll see things in sports that are innovative that then have application in patient care and, and disease specific. So I, I truly believe that will happen. Uh, Topher, I think you, you've kind of stayed away from the sports uh, investments a little bit. Why is that? Yeah, we've stayed, we've largely stayed away from within sports, uh, particularly, you know, health and wellness in, you know, the fitness app area. Um, and the reason is, at the end of the day, it's really hard to get people to change their behaviors. And people don't want to do things that are hard. Fitness is hard. Getting in shape is hard. Eating healthy is, is hard. And it requires a lot of dedication. And so, you know, engagement on the short term there seems to be really good, but engagement over long periods of time, particularly in those areas, tend to wane. You look at, you know, like in Equinox today, the traditional uh, gym, they make their money on the people that don't show up. And so, you know, we don't, you know, I, because of that, because of the behavior challenges there, we've largely just stayed, stayed away from it. Daniel, you're in The Athletic. Tell, I think this room probably understands what The Athletic is, but give us a super quick, I think it's very fascinating, as someone who's a member of the media, who has a, a, you know, a real passion for, I'm from the Seattle area, for Seattle, you know, hometown yeah. sports. That's a cool idea. What, what is it? Yeah, so for those that don't know, The Athletic is a subscription-based um, sports media company. So the, um, the starting point for that company was really starting with local sports. Um, and the, the thesis there when we, when we invested um, early on was that, you know, the world thinks that there is this kind of, uh, I guess, surplus of sports content. Um, and so if you look at kind of ESPNs, et cetera, of the world, there, there are a lot of companies out there that are covering sports at a national level and going kind of an inch deep. And that's it's, it's a logical um, kind of outcome of their business models, right? So if you're, if you're an advertising-based business, you're ultimately going to want the widest possible audience. You want page views. Um, and the way that you get those page views is by writing about things that a lot of people are interested in. So the kind of secret that we had was there is actually a huge surplus of content on, let's say, KD's you know, free agency, because um, a lot of people are interested in that. Um, but there's actually a massive undersupply of, um, like a, you know, this came out the other day, the Kawhi Leonard, you know, board man gets paid, you know, investigative style um, journalism, which, you know, we thought a lot of fans really wanted to get access to and just couldn't. So, you know, the thesis there was, at a national level, while it appears as though there's tons of supply, there was actually a chronic undersupply. And so the way that you get around that is you, you have this new business model around subscription. So, but, but yeah, so go on. Well, I was just gonna say, I think you gave a lot of people PTSD in this room, bringing up that KD injury, that was tough. Um, <laughs> when you look at being in the Bay Area, uh, it's kind of unique, right? We've seen, speaking of the Warriors, a lot of players are here in this room. We've seen a lot of athletes in the Bay Area get into investing. Um, it's not totally unique, of course, but it seems to be um, on a different level maybe than other parts of the country. I think some of you have done deals in which athletes are, are part of the, the cap table or whatever. Explain to me a little bit about, for people in this room who, who want to get involved in investing, like what is the value that you know, a, an NBA player might bring that someone like yourself would not uh, be able to provide? I think, I mean, we're just, look, at the end of the day, we're just investors. We are, um, you know, we're based in San Francisco, and, you know, we have a very small footprint. 
if you look at basketball um, and other sports, the footprint is now really worldwide. And you know, players across the board in all sports are now you know, worldwide figures. They have, they're renowned um, and they're so well known. And so bringing that to a cap table of a, say a consumer social company bringing in you know, Kevin Durant investing, you know, that's going to change the trajectory of that company potentially. And so, I was just going to say, is it mostly just for, for marketing purposes? Is that, is that what the greatest strength that someone brings in typically? Or, how, you know, are there, are there other things? They can bring in a lot of different perspectives. I mean, marketing tends to be one of, the, one of the main ones. But if you're an athlete investing in something in health and wellness, hey, you can bring personal experience to that. Um, and so that's something that we've seen uh, uh, athletes really bring to the table is, you know, very different perspectives. You know, we get very heads down as investors. You know, that's 100% of our time is doing that. And we can get wound up in our own thoughts sometimes. And so bringing in an outside perspective, someone who travels around constantly, has a huge following, interacts with people on a very different level than we do, you know, it's a, it's a different perspective. And they can add value that way. I think, um, I think there are two things that, um, on what Tofa said. One is, I mean, we really see early stage investing as kind of a form of pop culture now, right? Like it's gone from kind of the fringes to now sort of mainstream. Um, and so that's, I think part of it is, it's just kind of caused this wave of new actors, players, et cetera, to kind of come into the market. Um, and I think there are pros and cons to that, but I think that's the, that's the underlying phenomenon. Uh, I think where, when it comes to athletes specifically, I think there are two kind of um, sources of value add. One is, um, you know, I think in many ways athletes are entrepreneurs themselves, right? In the way that they kind of manage their own career and, and um, you know, think about their careers as not just what happens on the field or on the court. And so I, I find that that kind of entrepreneur to entrepreneur relationship um, is really valuable, right? Like when you're a founder of a company, things get really tough and lonely and to have someone in your, on your cap table that um, has gone through many of the same things that you've gone through albeit in a very different field, um, can be really helpful. Um, so that's, that's the first. And the second is really around this marketing piece that I think Tofa brought up. Like your point around Facebook and Instagram and Google, um, it's getting really hard to build a business based on paid marketing, right? Like if you look at the dominance of, of those channels and how kind of CPMs and customer acquisition costs have, have risen kind of secularly on those platforms, um, you know, comp every single consuming company that I talk to today um, is looking for that next channel and that kind of edge on, on marketing and distribution. And when you think about influencers, whether it be athletes or other celebrities, that's a huge edge, right? That's a proprietary, you know, what we would think of as kind of proprietary distribution if, if harnessed correctly. And so I think there's a really interesting, we're in a really interesting moment in time where kind of this influencer-led marketing, um, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Christina, yeah. I was yeah, and, and I would just echo, echo that. I think all of us sitting up here, many of us will control rounds. Like we submit our term sheet, we get to decide who comes in. We're incredibly thoughtful about the strategic nature of investors and what value they bring. Um, I would say to everyone in the audience, in, as it relates to healthcare, like we've all been touched by disease in some way, shape, or form. If there's something that you're really interested in and passionate about, study up on it. You can probably add value in some way, shape, or form to a company that's building a business around that. Um, a great example is diabetes, and just like the sheer number of people who are impacted by diabetes, and its inner cities are hit particularly hard, and there are a lot of things that could be done that would really help decrease the number of diabetes, including exercise and eating properly. And so when you look at that, even just that one particular sector, there's lots of ways people can get involved from an influencer perspective. And we're always thinking about that. And we always welcome people who have passion around subject areas and um, are committed, like at the end of the day, and want to help them roll up their sleeves. It's all about value add. I'm going to open it up to Q&A in just uh, two minutes or so. So if you have one, um, be ready. We're going to come to you. Last bit, a uh, little bit of a cliche, but I think it could be really relevant here. What is your one nugget of, of advice for people who are willing to part with a $50,000 check? <laughs> for, oh, good, no, you get, please. <laughs> for um, you know, we've, we've worked with a lot of 
uh, you know, athletes coming in, you know, wanting to start investing, um, actors, you know, influencers across all different sectors, and just also helping new fund managers and new angel investors figure out how to navigate this crazy ecosystem that is, you know, angel investing, seed investing. Um, the one thing I would say is, you know, you're here today networking. Find people that are either domain experts or investors. If you're an athlete, you might think about investing, what, 5% of your time, if that's, if, if, uh, uh, at most. We think about it 100% of our time. Ask for help, ask, uh, ask experts, ask domain experts for help evaluating companies. One of the things that can be really hard when you get into this is um, you know, having perspective. If you see a company, you might say, hey, this is really cool, I wanna invest in this one. Well, you might not know that there are 10 others that are very similar, and that's something that investors can help, can, can help do, is help provide perspective, help give coaching. Um, and so ask for help, this is a collaborative business, we all work together, we all co-invest. And so you know, don't feel like, hey, I have to make this, this decision myself, ask others. I would say don't get enamored. <laughs> like, it's easy to fall in love with an idea. It's easy to fall in love with an entrepreneur who has, you know, great passion and vision. You really, look, we walk, we'll walk away from a deal at any point in time. It could be a day before you're wiring your money if you find something that makes you doubt whether or not that business can be successful. And so it's really about that deep, deep, deep diligence and trying to take the emotions out of it and really be incredibly disciplined and objective. And you want to fall in love with an idea, but that, yeah, you have to balance it. Yeah, I would say um, you know, early stage investing is a game of power laws. Um, and what I mean by that is you know, the number one, number two investment in your portfolio will drive the returns of your entire portfolio, right? Um, and so, you know, the implication of that is you're really looking to not sort of invest, not spend time with kind of good enough businesses, what we call good enough businesses that have a bit of revenue, have some customers, um, you know, seem like they're kind of doing their thing, but ultimately will kind of never get to that, you know, kind of unicorn scale. Because the fact of the matter is, most of the time, um, you know, even the best investors are gonna be wrong, you know, 50% of the time at the early stage, right? And that's, that's probably a Hall of Fame, you know, batting record for an early stage investor. And so you need the winners to be really, really big to pay off for the losers. Um, and so at least what's helped me was, and is to really keep that front and center, really keep that, to your point, keep the bar high around can this business really be sort of one of the breakout sort of category defining companies versus, um, versus just kind of a good enough business. And don't be afraid to ask questions even if you think they're dumb. And seek experts and be honest about what you don't know. It will just help you. I do that literally all the time. Um, is there a question or two from the audience? We have just a few minutes, anybody? Raising hands, cool, right here. Sorry, there's a microphone coming for you. Hi, um, so I wanted to ask a question about <clears throat> your investment strategies around follow-ons, because I think that's very helpful for people to understand. So, you know, to, I like this theory where if you invested a dollar every second, you'll get to a million in 12 days. But if you invested a dollar every second to get to a billion, it'll take you 32 years, right? So the difference between getting into a billion dollar business and a million dollar business may be very different. So when do you put your, when you put your money down in a business that has now generated some significant revenue, how do you make the different decision than you did at the first stage where you're just early stage trying to decide whether this team can get to, you know, later on funding, but how do you decide when they reach significant traction whether you should continue to invest because they're gonna to get to venture scale returns. Yeah. I mean, I think it depends on every fund. Every fund is different in terms of their mandate. Um, we do early stage investing, seed and A, and we'll reserve for follow-ons. If things are working as they grow up, we'll want to lean into those. But at a certain point, it will be, on, be beyond our investment mandate. And every step of the way, we're thinking about 
who are the next investors that we want to bring into the next round and how do we support that company as they grow up? Or is there an opportunity for my LPs to invest through an SPV or a sidecar if they're interested in that? So there are lots of different ways that we think about it. It's one of the benefits of having a kind of your own fund and being flexible and agile, but we for sure reserve and we for sure plant, will lean into things as they grow up. Yeah, we're a little different in that we invest seed stage, um, you know, when we're, when we're just investing in the founder. And for us, what we do is we actually wait a few rounds. We wait for our information advantage, our relationship with the founding team, our knowledge of the metrics, and then we'll write a much larger check when we feel, when we have the confidence that, hey, this is a breakout company, now let's dive in, let's write a really big check. Because at the seed stage, from seed to series A, there are a lot of false positives. And so we don't want to get caught with you know, writing a ton of checks from seed to series A when there's actually the most dilution. That's the stage where you know, seed to A is roughly 20 to 30% dilution on average. Um, if we were to do a pro rata across all of our seed to series A companies, that'd be a huge amount of capital. We'd rather reserve that capital, wait till we see which company is the real breakout, which one is the Airbnb, the Pinterest, and then double down and invest a much larger amount there. Uh, uh, you know, I, I would put us probably closer to where Christine is, which is we would, um, we typically reserve for all of our portfolio companies. Um, we're a multi-stage fund, right? We're doing pre-seed investments all the way through to kind of pre-IPO rounds and leading those rounds. So we tend to be supportive over multiple rounds. Um, that said, we are looking at these things with fresh eyes every time, right? So we're trying to um, assess a company, um, and it's kind of easier said than done once you're in it, but we're trying to assess a company um, for a big pro rata check with, you know, as if we had not made that first investment. At least that's the, that's the goal. And you have to be okay saying you're not going to continue to invest when things aren't working. So it's just, yeah. you reserve, but you don't, that doesn't mean it's a guaranteed check for the next round. Um, we are out of time, sadly, but thank you all for your expertise, and all of you can probably find these folks afterwards if you have more questions. So thank you.